So good morning. My name is Helge Holden and I'm the secretary of the International Mathematical Union. And the IMU is responsible for the Fields Medal as well as the Nevan Lina Award. And I will be the chairman of this session. Our first speaker will be Vladimir Vodvodsky. He was born in Moscow in 1966 and received the Fields Medal in 2002. And he's currently working at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. And the title of his talk will be Unimath, which is a project he has been working on for some time. So the floor is yours, Vladimir. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you all for coming, despite such a beautiful weather outside. And um, so let me start. Uh, there, there probably will be some, well, l let me start. So actually, there will be two parts to my talk. Uh, when I started writing the slides, uh, after actually listening to some of the talks here before, uh, I decided, kind of being inspired by some of the things which were said, I decided that I need to, to have two parts in my, uh, in my talk. The first part will be Univalent Foundations, and the second part will be Unimass, per se. So Unimass is a library of formalized mathematics written on the basis of univalent foundations. But first I have to, um, I, I want to say um, some words about the univalent foundations as such. So um, there will be this kind of slides. Uh, and um, So, today we face uh, a problem that involves two difficult to satisfy conditions. Uh, on the one hand, we have to find a way to, uh, for computer-assisted verification of mathematical proofs. Uh, this is necessary, first of all, because we have to stop the dissolution of the concept of proof in mathematics. So, uh, so this is my main argument for why it's necessary, because uh, there are papers and more papers where um, there is a claim to something being proved, while uh, in actuality uh, it's not a proof what is written there. And uh, it, it, this kind of uh, problem propagates from, uh, from professor to student, obviously, because if professor writes this kind of proofs, then a student writes this kind of proofs, and then his student writes this kind of proofs. And um, it's very difficult to, um, to deal with because our, we don't have a clear-cut criterion of what constitutes a rigorous mathematical proof. And um, the only way which I can see, and, and uh, nobody so far has, uh, has suggested anything or uh, anything else, uh, is to have a computer, uh, a computer proof verification. Uh, in that case, uh, the concept of a proof becomes uh, fixed, at least to some degree, by by the condition, by necessity to satisfy um, the computer program, which, which uh, verifies the proof. And so you cannot just write this as obvious, or this is similar to, uh, to the previous lemma, or this is, um, uh, this is uh, so because our, uh, this is a folklore uh, result which everybody knows to be true. So these are uh, examples, especially the last one is, is most poisonous for, uh, for, the, um, for mathematics. And um, so this is my, uh, my major argument uh, towards the necessity of computer proof verification. Uh, on the other hand, we have to preserve the intimate connection between mathematics and the world of human intuition. Uh, we all do mathematics in our heads, first of all. And, and that means that mathematics is somehow rooted in, in our intuitive ability, in, in, um, 
in in our way of representing things internally uh, in our mind and uh, and this connection must be preserved uh, first of all because this connection is what moves mathematics forward it is through this connection to the intuitive mind there is a connection to the spirit of uh, both of individual and of uh, the society and the spirit is that what uh, what moves things forward um, and our this connection is uh, is what we often experience as the beauty of mathematics uh, through this connection we, we always experience what we call the beauty of mathematics and without this connection this uh, this experience of beauty would not be there um, So, Univalent Foundations is as yet imperfect solution to this problem. So, this is a problem, it has conditions, we have to provide a solution. Uh, in this case, there are many solutions, obviously, and Univalent Foundations is one of, this, uh, uh, of such solutions. So far, maybe, maybe the only one, maybe there will be others later. Um, but uh, so far, it's essentially the only one. So in the original form, uh, the UF, Univalent Foundations, combined three components. It was, first of all, the view of mathematics as the study of structures on sets and their higher analogs. So here, the first part, the this, this study of structure on sets, comes to us from, uh, from the time of Bourbaki, and the idea that we should also study structures on higher analogs of sets is something which comes to us from the second half of the 20th century when uh, categorical and higher categorical thinking was developing and when um, the under, when understanding of the fact that the collection of object of a category is not actually a set but something different uh, something um, which is defined not up to an isomorphism but up to an equivalence and uh, I mean again okay, no, um, and so, and, and that there are also higher and higher and higher analogs of it. Um, so this is the first component. The, the second component is the idea that the higher analogs of sets are reflected in the set-based mathematics as homotopy types. We cannot really say what they are using only the language of sets. Simply by, by kind of by definition, they, they, they go beyond sets. But, uh, but there is a reflection of, of, of these structures in, in the world of the set theoretic mathematics. And, and the way this, the, the higher analogs of sets themselves are reflected is, is, is as homotopy types. The, the, the homotopy types. They're reflected as homotopy types. And the understanding of this fact is, is due to, uh, to, to a large in, in a large extent to Grossendieck, which uh, who uh, who suggested the idea that uh, infinity groupoids provide a model for homotopy types, and uh, and then uh, and then I suppose to me, uh, who said that it's not the higher categories which we should uh, consider higher analogs of sets, but rather uh, higher groupoids which we should consider higher analogs of sets, and so when one combines these two. Um, ideas one um, one comes to the idea that um, they are reflected as homotopy types and the third component is the most complicated one as, as you can see it written down here but I'll read it the idea is that one can formalize our intuition about structures on this higher analogs using the martin Leff type theory MLTT extended by the law of excluded middle for propositions the axiom of choice for sets, and the univalence axiom, and the resizing rules. So, um, this is difficult to explain to, uh, 
to, to most to most people who uh, who, who learned mathematics in in uh, in the usual way. So I will um, kind of leave it as as just something which. Uh, Which is the fact of, <laughs> of of the structure of the univalent foundations, and then eventually it will become a little clearer, a little more clear. So the main uh, that was the original concept. Now, as as soon as this univalent, as soon as I announced this univalent foundations, as soon as they 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 were uh, kind of. Um, <laughs> They were short for the discussion of uh, and, and um, development of other people. So uh, different uh, new ideas started to uh, started to come in, and uh, the main new concepts that were added to this um, three are the following. Uh, so it was the understanding that a lot of mathematics can be formalized in Martin Luff type theory without law of excluded middle and without the axiom of choice. And that excluding these two axioms, one obtains foundations for a new form of constructive mathematics. That was totally unexpected to me and, uh, and to many other people. Uh, and, and it came out as a result of practical work on formalization. We just discovered that this uh, law of excluded middle and axiom of choice can be avoided in the univalent foundations much more uh, successfully, then they can be avoided in set theory. So things which cannot be done without them in set theory can be done without them in the univalent foundations. So then there was understanding that the classical mathematics appears as a subset of this new constructive mathematics. That is actually kind of an easy, easy thing to see, but it's important to emphasize that uh, one obtains the view of mathematics as constructive and then the classical mathematics as a subset of this constructive mathematics, a very important subset, uh, and it's kind of a retract. It's not only a subset, but it's, uh, it's a retract, uh, but uh, it's uh, still a subset. And then uh, the understanding that extending Martin Luff type theory with the univalence axiom, so um, of, of everything that was listed there, if we exclude uh, excluded middle and uh, axiom of choice, then what is left are, are the univalence axiom and the resizing rules. So we, we won't uh, discuss much resizing rules today, but. Um, there, was also, there also came understanding that extending uh, uh, Martin Left type theory with mm, univalence axiom um, pr produces an imperfect formalization system uh, for this co new constructive mathematics. And that it should be possible to do things a little differently. It should be possible to integrate univalent ax uh, the univalence axiom into the Martin Left type theory. Um, in a different way, obtaining a new type theory with better computational properties. Now I'm going to explain what it means, and, and this, is, this is now will be something which um, hopefully a, 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 a little different. Uh, so uh, what, what does it mean for a formalization system to be constructive? So there have been arguments and arguments and arguments and arguments about it. But in the case of type theory, there is an approach which is very simple and, and very precise. And I'm, that there is one kind of particular um, property of the system, which if, if, if it's present, then we can say that it's constructive. If it's absent, we can say that it's not uh, constructive. I mean, uh, this only applies to formal systems which are uh, type series. So let me explain things a little bit. So in type theory, uh, some expressions, so it's a formal system, so uh, the, the building blocks are expressions with uh, with free and bound variables. So some expressions in type theory are said to be in normal form. 
in type series which um, satisfy so-called uh, strong normalization property, uh, any expression can be automatically and deterministically normalized. Um, that is an equivalent expression in normal form can be computed. So there is an algorithm which is uh, known to be terminating. You input any expression, uh, it, uh, it outputs uh, an equivalent to it expression in normal forms, in, in normal form. So in type series there are type expressions and element expressions, or as one shortly says, types and, uh, and elements. So if T is a type expression and O is an element expression, then one writes O colon T uh, to, uh, to express the fact that the type of O is T. So this is, um, this is kind of the main, um, as it's called, judgment of, uh, of type theory, that a certain element expression has a type which is given by a certain type expression. Uh, in most type systems, there is the type of natural numbers. Uh, in Unimass, it's written as, uh, as NAT, N-A-T. So, in NAT, there is the zero element, which is called O, um, traditionally, and then there is a successor function, S, from NAT to NAT, that intuitively corresponds to the function that takes N to 1 plus N. That's how it uh, again um, happens in, in Unimath and, and in Koch in general. So uh, one says that, a that so, so any constructive system satisfies the so-called canonicity property for natural numbers. And this property asserts that the normal form of any expression O of type NAT has the form S followed by S followed by S and so on of O. So the normal form of any expression in, uh, of type NAT is just O uh, to which one applied um, a sequence of, um, um, to, to which one applied this successor function uh, sequentially so many times. Now if I take such a normal form print it out and count how many S's there are. This gives me an actual natural number uh, from, any element, uh, from any element expression of type NAT. So this is the canonicity property, that, that any uh, expression of type NAT actually corresponds to, to, an, uh, to a natural number that you can count um, in, in the uh, usual sense of the word. That, I mean, provided it's not too big. Um, so this is a tremendously strong property. Uh, consider, for example, a set. Uh, consider the example. A set X in H set is the name of, of the type of sets in, in Unimath. There is H in front to, to for, for certain reasons. Um, so a set is defined to be finite if there exists an isomorphism between it and the standard finite set STN, N, uh, with N elements where N is, is some natural number, something of type NAT. Uh, so here N is an expression of type NAT. This expression is well defined up to an equivalence and one obtains a function, which is again in Unimass called fin card, final, uh, finite cardinality, from uh, finite sets to NAT. So it's called cardinality, the number of elements of the set. Now suppose that I have proved constructively that the set X is finite. Then fin card of X in NAT is well defined. By normalizing this fin card of X, I obtain the sequence of S's which I can compute, so I obtain an actual natural number. 
So, for example, if I had a constructive proof of faulting theorem, which states that the number of rational points on a curve of genus greater than one is finite, I could find the actual number of points on any curve of genus greater than one. I would just input this curve there, uh, apply to it the proof of the theorem. Uh, it will uh, give me a finite set, the set of points of the curve. I will apply to this finite set the function fin card. I'll obtain a uh, an expression, probably an extraordinary long expression, of type natural numbers. I press the button, computer will normalize it, and will come up with a sequence of, uh, of S's applied to O. And I will count how many S's there are, and this will be the number. Uh, so that's why I'm saying that this is a tremendously strong property. We don't know whether such a proof exists, whether there exists a constructive proof of faulting theorem. It is a very interesting and hard problem. And uh, many people, as far as I know, tried. But they did not have something like Unimass. They, they just tried directly to uh, rewrite the proof in um, to, to, uh, just directly to, to kind of to, to uh, to get the, uh, the way of obtaining the number from the proof. Now, the reason that Martin left type theory plus the univalence axiom is an imperfect system for constructive formalization is that while MLTT itself, Martin left type theory, uh, has the canonicity property, if you add to it the univalence axiom, then the canonicity property disappears. So MLTT plus UA does not have a canonicity property. The problem is that when one takes this expression of type natural numbers, somewhere inside it there is sitting this univalence axiom. This univalence axiom is, for, from the point of view of the proof assistant, it's, it, it, it's a constant whose type is known but whose value is not known. It's just a constant added uh, to, to the system. And so when it starts to normalize this long expression, it, it hits this, uh, this univalence axiom here and there, and, and it cannot go further because it doesn't know. It's a constant whose value it doesn't know. So it cannot um, proceed to formalize the whole expression into, um, into a sequence of um, uh, successor functions. So Therefore, formalizing the proof of faulting theorem in the Unimass, which is based on MLTT plus UA, would not immediately give us an algorithm to compute the number of rational points on a curve of genus greater than one. This is where a new type theory that integrates the univalence axiom into the MLTT in such a way as to preserve the canonicity would help. And the search of such a type theory became one of the main driving forces in the development of the univalent foundations in the recent year, in, in, in the last three, four, five years. Today, several groups are working uh, on the construction and implementation and a proof assistant of candidate type theories which satisfy, which, uh, satisfy this uh, property. Uh, at the moment, there is a cubical type theory, and the prototype proof assistant for it, which is called cubical TT, so it's cubical type theory, uh, which is created by the group of Thierry Coquand uh, from, um, so he himself is from uh, Gothenburg in Sweden, and, um, but it was done with the help of many researchers from different parts of the world. And it is at the most advanced stage of development today. So a proof in Unimass easily translates into a proof in cubical TT. And it is a conjecture that cubical TT actually does have canonicity property. 
And this conjecture is becoming more and more um, believable, I would say, because more and more things are being proved about cubicle TT, which make it um, believable. So, um, so it's quite possible that we'll uh, have such a type theory. And then the Unimass proof translated into this type theory will, um, will allow us to, um, to obtain numbers. So then, of course, the problem is to construct a Unimass proof. So the new form of the univalent foundations that emerges can be seen as a combination now of the following components. So it's still the view of mathematics as the study of structures and sets and their higher analogs. That remains the, the core of, of, of the foundations. Now, the, the view of mathematics as constructive with the classical mathematics being a subset consisting of the results that require law of excluded middle and or axiom of choice among their assumptions. The idea that higher analog of sets are reflected in the set-based mathematics as constructive homotopy types. Now, constructive homotopy types is something new. Uh, so far, it's objects of the new constructive homotopy theory, which is only being developed, and that we can only so far formulate in terms of cubical sets. Uh, thanks to, uh, to the work by the group of, uh, of Kakand. It should be possible, of course, to formulate them in all these different other in which, uh, in which homotopy theory exists, and, but we don't know how to and, and w w what kind of modifications uh, these other methods require in order for them to, um, to uh, in order for, for it to be possible to do them constructively. Uh, and this is a very interesting um, direction. I mean, this, 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 there are just lots and lots of problems which are all open. And uh, which all combine kind of this high-level abstract uh, intuition uh, often with, uh, with formulas and, and computations in, in, a very, uh, in a very unusual way. So um, this is a slide which I might have skipped. Um, so in addition to the understanding that to obtain a formal system for the new constructive mathematics, uh, the univalent axiom needs to be integrated into the MLTT constructively. Several more things are felt as lacking in the combination of MLTT and univalent axiom. So there is something which is called higher inductive types, a very interesting um, class of constructions. Uh, resizing rules. Um, a possible string, uh, strict uh, extensional equality combined with the Fibernstein discipline, that's another direction where, again, several groups of people are working. Most of the groups which I'm referring to, most of these people, are the computer science departments. They're, most of them are the computer science departments in Europe, and, and now, um, now some of them are also in the computer science departments in in the United States. And as yet unknown mechanism for, uh, to construct the types of structures that involve infinite hierarchies of coherence conditions, such that invariantly constructing uh, the type of uh, infinity, uh, infinity one categories, for example. We, we, we don't know how to do it, and it's, uh, and, and it's in a very, very... Uh, I don't know how to say, but it's it, 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 it's it's a problem which it's a very very important problem. Uh, 
it, it, it's something which is really lacking, and 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 we, we really uh, want to to have it uh, uh, to have it solved. Uh, it, it's a major problem. Um, surprisingly, it might be easier, much easier actually, to add these features to the cubicle type theory than to the uh, Martin Lift type theory, and the work in these directions is ongoing. So this is the story of the Univalent Foundations uh, up to today, um, with uh, with what um, with what was, with what is, with what we are uh, looking for, and of course we are always looking for for unexpected, uh, interesting um, ideas and directions. So uh, the the second part of uh, my talk is, is the Unimath library, and um, so this is now a, a, a one particular direction. So Univalent Foundations is a big thing. Uh, Unimath library is one direction. So we, what we did, we we kind of locked the the the, the theory. Uh, at a certain level. We, we, we froze this theory at the level of MLTT plus UA plus resizing rules um, and decided to see what we can do in terms of formalization of, of existing mathematics uh, with, this, uh, uh, with this amount of, of enabling foundations and with the existing uh, tools like existing proof assistant. So we uh, we decided we are going to be very conservative and, and uh, in, 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 in the tools which we allow ourselves to use and then we uh, start to develop, uh, to, to formalize mathematics. Uh, and in the development of the Unimath library we attempt to do something that might be compared with the effort by the Bourbaki group to write a systematic exposition of mathematics so Bourbaki group had the idea of writing systematic exposition of mathematics based on the set theory and the view of mathematics as studying structures on sets. That's their uh, idea and that's what they tried to do. The effort by Bourbaki stalled at some point around the middle of the 20th century in part because it was very complicated to describe the emerging category theoretic constructions in set theoretical terms. If one tries to write down the category theoretic constructions like very, very, very carefully, and that's what Bourbaki was doing. They were doing everything very, very, very carefully without kind of skipping any details. So if there was a set X and then a set X times one point set, they would never say that these two sets are equal. They would always have to consider an isomorphism between them. So, um, so they were very, very, very careful. And when one tries to do at this level of rigor category theoretic constructions, it becomes very complicated. Uh, so that was the story of Bourbaki. One might may ask, however, uh, is there any mathematical innovation in what we're doing with the Unimass? Not, not with the Univalent Foundations, but with the Unimass. Is there a discovery of the unknown in the work on the Unimass? We have already seen how well-known problems in fields such as arithmetic algebraic geometry can be related to the search for a new foundation of constructive mathematics and for building proofs in the Unimass. But aside from that problem of, of making proofs constructive, which is of course um, uh, a very important one, uh, is there is there any mathematical innovation in, 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 in the work on Unimass besides this problem? So here is a different example. So some years ago uh, at the IS, um, I had a conversation at lunch with, uh, with Armand Borel. Um, I mentioned how I like Bourbaki algebra and how it helped me to become a mathematician. I then mentioned that some places there were really dense. 
Uh, for example, said I, the description of the tender product was very hard to follow. Of course, said Borel, we have invented tender product right there at our meetings to get systematic exposition of multilinear maps. So it was new research, and that is why it was not very smoothly written. And I was totally amazed, because it's hard to imagine today's mathematics without the concept of tender product. And it would never occur to me that it was invented by Bourbaki with the only purpose to obtain a more systematic exposition of multilinear maps of vector spaces. So, I mean, I, I, I remember that I was really, really kind of stunned. And this example shows how a major innovation can emerge from the work on systematization of knowledge. Finally, just a few words to those mathematicians who uh, may decide to understand Unimath and maybe to contribute to it. So the Unimath library is being created using the proof assistant clock. It is freely available at GitHub, on GitHub. Uh, the language of Coq is a very substantial extension of Martin Leaf type theory, and Unimath uses a very small subset of the full Coq language that approximately corresponds to the original uh, Martin Leaf type theory. So the, the very first file in the Unimath library after the preamble is called part A dot V. The dot V, by the way, that has nothing to do with me. Dot V is, is the name of, of uh, is the standard extension of Coq files, which has existed way before, uh, before I uh, learned Coq. Uh, so the first line in, in this file, part A dot V, after the preamble section, is as follows. Definition from empty, colon, Pi x colon u u comma empty arrow x do, uh, uh, period. So it should be understood as a declaration of intent to define a constant called from empty whose type is described by the expression that is written to the right of the colon. So this expression actually pi can be read as for all in this case, and the, the type says for all x in u u, u u is the universe uh, over which we work, so for all x, uh, for, all, for, all, for any type x, for all x in the universe, uh, there is a function from empty type to x. So we all know that empty is uh, the initial object, so to speak, and, and so this is the uh, state, this is, um, um, this is supposed to express, this, this is how we express it in Unimass. And um, the following this line, there is a paragraph that starts with the word proof and ends with the word defined, where this constant is actually defined. Uh, using the little sub-programs of Coq called tactics, which help to build complex expressions of the underlying type theory language in simple steps. Um, so a mathematician who wants to understand Unimath should expect a very non-linear learning curve. In the lectures that I gave in Oxford and in the similar lectures uh, at the math department of the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, it took me the whole first lecture, and that was two hours, not one, to explain what that first line and the following it paragraph really mean. So to explain the previous slide, it, 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 to really kind of seriously explaining every single, single thing there is, uh, is approximately two hours. In the next lecture, I was able to explain the next few hundred lines, lines of part A. And in the fourth lecture in Oxford, the video of which can be found on my website, I was explaining the invariant formalization of vibration sequences, something which is quite advanced. So if one invests this two hours, roughly speaking, into the first line, one has a very good chance to 
to start moving much faster after that. Um, so this is just, ju this is my direct experience. I mean, that's not how I planned things, it's just how it turned out. I, I, I came, I wanted to explain Unimats line by line, I put it on, on the projector. I also had blackboards around and it was Oxford uh, audience, mathematical and computer science and, and then, well, mathematical mostly. And, and then Hebrew University audience, both of them were quite, um, quite well versed in mathematics, but that's how long it took me with, with uh, uh, audience interaction to, uh, to explain what's going on there and then how fast I could move later. Um, so I hope that I was able to show how important univalent foundations are and how important is the work on libraries such as Unimaths. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. The floor is open for questions or remarks. Hi, thank you for the talk, it was wonderful. Um, could you clarify uh, what you meant by um, what Bourbaki came up with about the tensor product? As far as I was aware, that goes back to at least Hermann Grossman and the roots of linear algebra. So can you just give us more clarity on what innovations the Bourbaki group added? Well, I don't know what, uh, uh, well, Grassmann, uh, I, I have read Grassmann, and um, Grassmann certainly didn't have any idea of, of our modern concept of an abstract vector space. He, uh, he, he didn't know what a set is. I mean, he had a lot of very, very interesting uh, ideas and, and, and philosophical ideas too in, in, in that book, but, uh, the tensor product does not go back to, to Grassmann. Uh, that's, uh, that's the point. Now, uh, the innovation was to introduce uh, the construction of tensor product on uh, vector spaces. To take two vector spaces and to obtain a third vector space which you take uh, by taking first uh, pairs of elements, uh, writing this uh, little sign between them, and then uh, taking the free abelian group, a free vector space, and then taking the quotient. Uh, so this construction altogether uh, is due to Bourbaki. That's, that's what uh, Armand Barrel told me. I should tell you that I haven't, uh, I haven't done uh, historical research and haven't tried to check it. So if, if somebody does the research and, and tells me we discovered that somebody else um, did it before, uh, that would be at the, uh, uh, on Armand's Barrel. Uh, <laughs> um, kind of, uh, um, I, I'm basing what I'm saying on, on his words. And, and, and the, the way he, he, he talked about it, 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 it looked very, 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 very true. <laughs> Any other questions? There's one up front here. Thank you for the talk. Uh, and the question is, uh, so, the example with Burbaki shows that even uh, having a constructive proof, it will take a long time to uh, write it down, uh, like, uh, for example, using a Unimath language. Is it true? I mean, is it really possible, it, will it really possible to work by, for mathematicians to write mathematical proofs using Unimath language? Uh, Yes, it is possible. We're actually doing it at, at the moment. We, we have a project on uh, um, categorical structures in type theory uh, because there is in, in the semantics of type theory and um, with, with two other uh, mathematicians. And um, we actually decided that we are not writing uh, LATAC text before, uh, before things are formalized. Uh, 
because it turns out to be so much easier to write LaTeX text after they're formalized. Uh, because you, then you have the whole structure uh, and, and the paper comes out to be much more um, kind of, it, it's, it, it, it's much more beautiful because, because the things are really in the order in which they must be in order to, 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 to have logical uh, coherence. So yes, I mean yes, it is in in some fields, we, not in all fields yet. In, in 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 particular fields, it is realistic right now. In in other fields, uh, there is there is a need to to improve the um, uh, the proof assistance. A final question. There is one from from here. Is there any other question or what? Well, I, I yep, would have a question here. Okay, if, uh, if there is uh, one over there who wants to, to ask, there was um, a hand. Yeah, um, so we, had, uh, we have heard a lot about the power of machine learning and advances in uh, learning techniques. Using your foundations as you presented, would it be possible to have machines coming up with uh, new theorems like substantial theorems themselves? and? How do you see then the uh, role of a mathematician in 50, 100 years? Uh, this is a very important question. And this is where I may want to come back to the very first slide of mine, and where I said that we need to satisfy two conditions. Uh, and the second condition is preserving this uh, intimate connection between mathematics and the world of human intuition. So uh, the question of Automated proofs. Uh, it, it's it's a complex it's 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 a complex thing. So for one thing, machine in itself is unlikely to. It doesn't have the driving force, so to speak. It's it's not clear what how it will choose the direction in which to to move. Because this driving force comes from inside us. And, uh, and, and we don't know how to, uh, and, and thanks God we don't know how to, uh, how to pass it to the machines. Uh, so, uh, well, I don't believe in, in well, never mind. But, uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> but, uh, but this, is, this is a function of the spirit to, to, to move things forward. And, and, and machine in itself, one then would have to give it a very, um, clear directions of, of, in, of, of how to move forward. Um, uh, automation in proof assistance is, is an important thing, but it, it's, it's also very important to, to kind of not to lose uh, intuitive meaning of, of, of proofs uh, in the process of automating, uh, automating them. So the proof still must be understandable, and and, uh, and and it still must kind of raise something in 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 the reader who understands it. Uh, if if it's just a sequence of zeros and ones, then uh, then the main function of of a proof as well one of the main functions of a proof as as. Um, Is something which which interacts with uh, with our human our human mind with with human spirit uh, would be lost. Okay, I think we will close the discussion here and thank Vladimir once more. <laughs>